The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Kelly Barnhill is the director of the Nutrition Clinic at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. She is a certified clinical nutritionist with over a decade of experience working with nutrition in children with autism and related disorders. At the Johnson Center, she directs a team of dietitians and nutritionists that have served more than 3,000 children through her practice. In addition to her clinical practice, Kelly also serves as the clinical care director overseeing management and implementation of multidisciplinary care across the practices within the organization. Kelly also serves on the board of ARI. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support, including a grant from Local 25 Boston Teamsters. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I will turn it over to Kelly. Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much for joining us today to learn a little bit more about the specific carbohydrate diet that we have been working on um, in a study perspective. And my goal here today really is to share with you um, how we established the SCD study that we have recently completed and will be publishing shortly. Um, what that looked like and walk through our decision making on inclusion and exclusion criteria, how uh, the labs that we took, the information that we gathered throughout the process. And then I want to spend a tiny bit of time talking about the case study that we published a few months ago in JAD that highlighted one participant. Uh, and then I hope to have ample time at the end of this to answer any questions you might have at all about the study or otherwise uh, regarding STD. So let's get started. Many of you, if you've used the specific carbohydrate diet for yourself or your child, probably know that it originated out of work done in the 1930s, published in the early 1950s, um, primarily as a dietary protocol for celiac disease. Uh, as information emerged that celiac disease um, was a function of gluten response and reactivity that created this autoimmune issue, um, the diet uh, STD specifically became less used and employed and a gluten-free diet um, became the primary intervention for those with celiac disease. Then about 30 years later, Elaine Gottschall published a book uh, and began working and subsequently published a book in the early 1990s that became um, highly recognized and used in the autism community as families were beginning to look at um, the use of SCD as an intervention for their children with autism who also had perhaps GI issues and those who even didn't have GI issues, families began to use it as an intervention. Uh, but unfortunately, even then, the evidence was minimal for, um, I guess, the scientific validation of its use, but um, families nevertheless began to do this and see improvements with their kids. Later, in the early 2000s, um, some research ent entities around the country began looking at the use of SCD in a variety of other issues as well, so Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and even there are some studies out there now looking at its impact, SCD's impact on chronic diarrhea of an unknown origin. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, there's minimal work out there still, even, you know, 25 years later uh, on from uh, breaking the vicious cycle, um, there's minimal work on the use of SCD in a, uh, autism. Um, and our goal, really, in, in building this study was to create as comprehensive and as tight an approach to gathering accurate data to share with the science community on the validity of specific carbohydrate intervention for kids with autism. So when we uh, designed the study, we wanted to look at something that was a pilot uh, that was open label, um, specifically for kids with autism. We wanted to control the food that the kids were receiving so that there was no question about the quality and nature and compliance 
with the diet and its intervention. Uh, we wanted to be able to quantify as best as possible any changes in GI presentation whatsoever. And we also wanted to look at behavioral changes, anthropometric changes, and any biochemical changes that may have occurred through the implementation of this therapy as well. So our hope when we designed the study was that the SCD would be tolerated by at least 90% of participants, um, that we would create a positive response, um, specifically from a GI perspective, because we know that many of the children that we see have had terrible constipation or diarrhea, and we wanted to be able to accurately assess and hopefully impact in a positive way um, those GI symptoms. And we also wanted to, given our clinical experience, we had seen many, many children um, who gained weight, who gained height, uh, and um, were getting much more nutrition through the food that they were eating after beginning SCD. So our study design was, again, it was a pilot, but we chose to enroll uh, 20 children, um, and we ended up enrolling more, and several uh, were removed from the study through the process, either by because they simply couldn't accept the food, or because um, they uh, were struggling with maintaining the diet at home. Um, so we had a total of 20 that completed the study. These children were participating in, in two places, so at our center here in Austin and also at Hopewell Associates in Massachusetts under the uh, care of Pam Farrow and her team. Um, the inclusion criteria for study participants was we wanted a tight group in terms of age, and um, we wanted kids who had an ASD diagnosis that we then verified on enrollment in the study. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was documented evidence, preferably from a treating practitioner, so a pediatrician or a GI specialist, a dietitian who had documented any of these GI symptoms that you note here. Um, and the other inclusion criteria that we wanted to make certain of was that the child was not participating in any other therapeutic trial concurrently. Um, in addition, the parents really needed to understand and appreciate uh, the nuances of SCD, why we were doing, what um, compliance really involved, um, and they were committed to meeting with a dietitian on a weekly basis through the 16 weeks of treatment. We had a number of exclusion criteria that we established as well. So if a child had started an SCD at any point in the past, we did not want to include them, and we chose that. It was painful, <laughs> but we chose that for very specific reasons so that um, we would see the initial impact of SCD on an individual who had not followed this dietary intervention in the past um, so that we um, could get accurate data from a GI perspective and also from a behavioral perspective on that. Um, any child who tested or had a recent infectious colitis um, or tested with a colitis at the time of study enrollment was excluded. And then there were also a number of metabolic and genetic syndromes, metabolic disorders and genetic syndromes that we also felt would impact a child's GI status, feeding behavior, anthropometric status, um, and we did not want to complicate findings in any way through that. So additionally, we did not include anyone who was receiving um, enteral or IV nutrition. Um, and while you can do that safely on SCD, uh, they are, um, it's difficult and that was not something that we wanted to tackle in this, um, in this pilot. And the last thing that we looked at and we thought about at length before deciding that we should also exclude any child who was on any psychiatric medication or who had received psychiatric medication three months prior to enrollment and dietary initiation um, to take another layer of potential complication off the table. So again, I mentioned that we chose um, a prospective multi-center open design 
Um, so everybody knew that they were on SCD and there was no control group involved in this study. We provided all the food for all the participants for the 16 weeks that they were uh, enrolled in the treatment phase of the study. So they received three meals and two snacks per day that was prepared in a commercial kitchen by a chef that was very familiar with this diet. Um, and a clinician, a dietitian at each study location and, and study site prompted and counseled every step of the way through this process so that families had immediate access to a professional who had prior experience with SCD implementation during that uh, initial phase and also on an ongoing basis through the study. Um, at various times, we met with families throughout the treatment phase and then following the treatment phase as well to collect appropriate data, which was different each time. So we tracked height and weight. We did blood work throughout um, at several time points. Um, and we looked at behavior changes and GI changes throughout the treatment phase and following as well. So the total duration of the study was 12 months. The treatment phase was 16 weeks. So we gathered information from uh, time point zero, which was baseline enrollment, through treatment, which was four months of SCD intervention with ongoing counseling. Um, and then following that, we wanted to see what happened and were families still on SCD? If they weren't, what were their symptoms like? What had happened and what changed over the next eight months after this treatment had ended? Uh, so we did a six month follow up, eight weeks out from discontinuation of provided treatment. And we also did a one year follow up to see where kids were at the end of their inter, uh, intervention and, and we wanted to track and see if families were still following the, the SCD or if they'd moved on to a different diet or if they had um, reverted to uh, what they were doing before we began the intervention. We did comprehensive diagnostic evaluation when we uh, enrolled kids at baseline. So all of the participants um, had an SCQ, which is just a component of um, the, uh, which is a screening tool that's used. Um, so we had an SCQ on everyone, then we did it an ADIR. Uh, we had a baseline PDDBI. Then we also wanted to track um, sleep habits. So they completed a sleep habit questionnaire and we gathered some additional data on behavior through the Vineland and also the sensory profile. Fasting blood work that we completed included a CBC and a CMP. We tracked ferritin and iron because we wanted to um, look at the status there. Um, we looked at prealbumin from a protein perspective. We also got some um, inflammatory markers to look at any ongoing inflammation in the body through the sed sedimentation rate and a C-reactive protein. Our stool analysis was a three-day comprehensive stool collection that looked at um, bacteria, fungus, and parasites, and also gave us information on, uh, again, some inflammatory markers such as lactoferrin, calprotectin, and eosinophilic protein X. Um, the other information that we got at baseline included comprehensive anthropometrics, so height, weight, and then also mid-arm circumference and a few other markers that we could track. Uh, we got as comprehensive as possible a three-day food diary and a baseline gastrointestinal questionnaire that was very comprehensive and asked specific questions about gastrointestinal pain, behavior associated with bowel movements, um, the nature of those bowel movements, um, and families filled that out for us throughout the study. So for the treatment phase, all food was shipped or delivered for the entire 16 weeks by this commercial chef in the facility that I mentioned. All menus were tracked, evaluated, changed with a, a dietitian or a clinician at either Hopewell or the Johnson Center. Um, and we were very careful in aligning where a child moved into the study um, and what they were eating initially to work them through that, both the intro diet and also the acceptance of um, 
new foods or different foods. So we tried to the best of our abilities to align current food preferences with SCD legal and appropriate foods so that we could track and move them without a lot of pain into a very new and different approach for most families. Um, so the first three, day for, three days for us, um, to the best of our abilities and as children would accept it, um, was a pretty clean introductory diet. So we used a lot of uh, broth, either homemade organic chicken, turkey, or beef broth um, throughout the day. Um, we had very cleanly prepared organic chicken, turkey, or beef and eggs at times if kids could tolerate eggs. We had several children who did not. Um, we used um, apples and pears and carrots that were all um, prepared based on the guidelines outlined by Elaine Gottschall in Breaking the Vicious Cycle. And we also included cooked and de-seeded zucchini um, prepared appropriately as well. In terms of additional carbohydrate intake, we allowed several um, cups of apple cider, white grape juice, or pear juice um, to come up to 16 ounces total for most participants. Um, and we suggested that families uh, dose that in water uh, throughout the day so that kids had a constant intake of carbohydrates um, as they were coming off of diets that were heavily carbohydrate driven. Um, and we were moving them to this um, approach that was not. Um, and then beyond that, we created sample weekly menus in conjunction with families um, that looked very different for each child. Having said that, we worked with um, the commercial chef and, uh, in the kitchen to work on things that um, were fun for each kid and we found some foods that kids gravitated to over and over again once they moved into the diet. Um, in general, we tried to have every child get at least eight ounces of bone broth each day. Um, we tried for 16. We used lots of eggs uh, for kids who could tolerate eggs. We made um, egg noodles and red sauce was a big favorite of many participants with lots and lots of pureed vegetables that we used in a variety of ways. So these are all SCD legal. Um, and then as children became more advanced in their preferences and also their ability to tolerate foods, we began to add other things in later in the diet. So nut flour, nut butter cookies, um, muffins, etc. Other things like um, in terms of our, uh, the boxes that we shipped to each family, they included, um, food for a week that was delivered once a week, two days after uh, the check-in with the dietitian, so that at that check-in appointment, we could look at total intake, what their child's preferences were, what they liked and what they didn't like that we'd tried the prior week. And then we would have a conversation with the commercial uh, chef and place an order for the next order. It would be cooked the following day and either delivered or shipped out. Um, we felt like there were some children who, and as, a, as parents, if you're on here and listening to this, who simply were not satiated with the amounts of food that we were providing, though many of the kids, even if they were three or four years old, were getting upwards of 3,000 calories a day, they were still hungry. Um, we worked with families to identify foods that were not, foods or drinks that were not provided by the chef to fill in the gaps um, just in case there was a problem. And that really only happened with a handful of children, but there were children that um, really sincerely presented in a way that made you believe they were hungry, they still needed nutrition, they were gaining weight, they were, everything looked good, but they wanted to eat. And so we worked ways into increasing their orders or uh, giving them foods that mom could purchase that were prepared and also SCD legal. So I wanted to give you some ideas now, in addition to um, kind of an outline of what the study looked like, I wanted to give you a couple of anecdotal stories, I guess, about um, a couple of the participants that we had and their response. Um, the first child I wanna to talk to you about is um, a child who came in, was um, 
four years old, uh, was in a preschool program, in an ABA program, and his diet consisted of what you see on the screen. There was a lot of fast food involved, really one of the few things the child, um, the few fruits that the child would eat was apple puree, lots and lots of baby foods. Nothing was really, nothing was accepted that um, was a true um, fruit or vegetable in true fruit or vegetable form. Um, there, were, there was a lot of, in addition to the fast food, the mom had been um, encouraged and it was recommended by her pediatrician that um, she needed to include Pediasure and whole um, organic milk and uh, low-fat yogurt to bol bolster the caloric and protein intake because you won't see, as you see, there aren't many protein options here um, in, in the child's introductory diet that we uh, gathered information on at baseline. So we, um, this child worked closely with the clinician. Mom had immediate access to the treating um, and, uh, clinician and counseling throughout the introductory diet period. Um, we felt like we got to a place where the child would be successful after some counseling through baseline. Um, and the, the child was really frustrated with, um, with the switch in the diet. And we had hourly check-ins for the first few days because it was so stressful for mom to beginning, beginning this. However, a couple of days into it, um, mom heard some of the first language that she'd ever heard from her child. Uh, he started running a low-grade fever, um, which is something also that's fairly typical that we see in this introductory diet phase. And he started eating. Didn't eat much, but he started eating a little. Um, at the end of that first week, at day five, I guess, um, we instructed mom to get him to a pediatrician just to check in with their current treating primary care um, because we wanted to make sure that someone had who had tracked this child for a very long time had his eyes on um, what was happening as well. Um, and... <clears throat> The pediatrician at that point said, you know what, he looks different, but any is in a good way, and I want you to continue exactly what you're doing. And the most interesting thing for us was that even we had that difficult food refusal phase at the front end, and he didn't eat much food at all for the first half of the week, at the first check-in, he'd gained a, a pound. Um, so the second time that our clinician saw him, he'd already started gaining weight. Um, he'd moved from uh, voluminous diarrhea to two huge bowel movements each day, and he started sleeping through the night. And that was, you know, early on in treatment phase. So we were very hopeful for him, and he continued to progress um, in a positive way throughout the study. Another subject uh, that I wanted to kind of highlight for you and kind of point out to you that everybody came to this from a very different place um, was a child that we saw who was quite young, who was on the younger end of our um, kids that we enrolled. Um, he drank cow's milk via bottle and he only ate pizza, cheese, cheese crackers, um, and other forms of um, cheese snacks. So he was highly casein driven, highly milk driven. He refused all other foods and um, we worked with mom at baseline with lots of counseling and lots of talking before we ever got to the place where we began the introductory diet. He had some fairly significant GI symptoms. He did not sleep through the night. And at, obviously, his food selectivity and, and food preferences were he self-restricted to a very specific food group and self-selected away from everything else. Uh, mom had worked with a speech therapist on feeding therapy without any great results for the year prior to enrollment in the study. Um, and he had self-limited down to this milk consumption for almost 18 months. So it started when he was about 18 months and he continued this pattern of behavior until he was almost three. So uh, he took a while to transition um, to the diet. He only wanted to eat 
almond crackers, fruit, and celery. Um, we did try a, an introductory diet with him, um, and we were semi-successful. Um, but uh, the good parts that happened early on again were that his GI symptoms improved immediately when we took away his preferred foods. Um, as he transitioned into SCD, he started talking. Um, his sleep improved, and it's always, just as with the other child I mentioned, as a clinician who really believes in this intervention, it's always nice for me to have an objective party or a semi-objective party, or perhaps even someone who's skeptical, third party, um, look at a child who's going through dietary change and say, wow, that looks really good. So the pediatrician, and also um, we spoke with teachers and therapists, both in the ABA program and at school, who said, this looks amazing. And the only thing that really changed in this interim was his dietary intake. The last thing I want to review with you carefully and fairly quickly is um, the brief uh, report that we published a few months ago in July. Um, we enrolled a child in the study. Uh, he met all criteria to our knowledge. Um, we completed the entire baseline process. He began treatment. And then at his six-month check-in, when we were gathering data two months out from treatment, where he was still on SCD that the family was doing after getting some coaching and counseling from um, an SCD chef, um, we learned through data that the family provided that the child also had a, a genetic syndrome and had a fragile X diagnosis, which uh, excluded him from the study. And we did not get that information at the front end of the study, um, but we were obligated to remove the child from the big study that we're working on. Um, and given that we had such tight data and had collected so much information, we chose to publish it as a case report, uh, separate and distinct from the main data of the larger um, studies that'll be coming out soon. So subject number 12 gained uh, three and a half pounds in the 16 weeks of treatment with us. He transitioned fairly easily into um, SCD. Just as an aside, he had uh, followed a gluten and casein-free approach for a, a period of time prior to uh, joining the study. He was tracked by and had worked with several uh, physicians who were knowledgeable about uh, both dietary and supplemental support for kids with autism and also several dietitians who helped prescribe and work diet uh, issues for his mom. Um, he grew a little over an inch during the treatment phase of the study and his BMI increased um, over that time frame as well. His dietary intake um, showed first a shift in macronutrients. So he, as you would expect for a child in this study, um, his primary source of uh, energy prior to enrolling in the study was through carbohydrates. So we had a very high carbohydrate intake that was well over RDA um, and a reasonable but lower protein and fat consumption. And those numbers flipped because when you begin a specific carbohydrate diet, um, you're not limiting or decreasing carbs, but the percentage of the dietary intake and the nutrition that you're looking at with children often shifts to a lower level of total carbohydrate intake or a reasonable level of carbohydrate intake and fat and protein intake increases. It also showed an increase in micronutrients, which again is fairly obvious because um, we moved from a fairly typical uh, gluten and casein-free diet, which included um, gluten-free bread, which didn't have, doesn't have a lot of uh, innate nutrition and uh, snacks, which don't really contain a lot of nutrition because often they're not fortified, to a nutrient-dense um, SCD that was specifically recommended for him to meet his dietary intake goals. So in terms of GI results, um, this was pretty powerful for us because this, this child had some fairly significant GI concerns despite being on a gluten and casein-free diet for years, despite a lot of supplementation and support, 
um, uh, despite, you know, he'd seen a GI specialist and there, the GI specialist said there was, it wasn't remarkable and there was no need for care, but um, this child could not go to the bathroom often without the use of an enema. If there, if an enema wasn't used, um, he simply could not, he was, uh, he could not have a bowel movement. Um, the family reported that he, it was a, something that he would request that he needed help going to the bathroom. Um, and that's not unusual, really. Um, we had several children who um, enrolled who needed, uh, had severe constipation concerns. We also had, and um, more often, we had more children who enrolled who had diarrhea concerns. But we had a handful of children who had fairly significant constipation concerns despite, despite a number of different interventions and modalities that just did not seem to be helping. So after the treatment phase, his stool was formed, but normal sized. He had no further difficulty with bowel movements, and he lacked the irritability surrounding a bowel movement. So family, the family would report that he was anxious and irritable both before and after a bowel movement because it was such a traumatic experience for him, really, and that behavior completely disappeared once he began the diet. In terms of overall behavioral changes, um, his total uh, PDDBI assessment and inventory, his composite store decreased by 15%, which uh, is, is significant. Um, we saw a reduced um, repetitive and ritualistic behaviors, reduced sensory seeking behaviors. Um, fam the family reported that there was a decrease in pragmatic language concerns, that he didn't have unusual fears any longer, and an increase in receptive and expressive language. So overall, this family felt like uh, the diet made it, uh, a positive impact on him, and he maintained this diet um, at the six-month mark when um, he ended uh, participation in the study, but for several um, months after. And then I, I believe, and I know this from a clinical perspective, that when mom checked in with the clinician, she reported that she trialed introducing some non-SCD legal foods and some of his GI symptoms returned. So she went back to a strict SCD approach and maintained that on an ongoing basis. That was the primary, also, um, that was our experience across the children who began this intervention with us, that they, when they exited the treatment phase at 16 weeks, the majority, if not all families, continued that at least through the six month. So, so that's the data and the information that I wanted to share with you about our study design and uh, what uh, our hopes were in approaching it. I wanted to kind of highlight some of the findings that we had from the case study that has been published. And now I have plenty of time for questions um, on any aspect of SCD, really. So I'm happy to answer anything that um, you want to ask. Okay, great. Kelly, thank you so much. Uh, people can type questions into the question section now. And I do have some questions that were sent ahead of time. So I'll start with those. Uh, the first question here is about antibiotics on SCD. So this is a parent who has used antibiotics to address different GI problems, and they're wondering if there are any issues if they're if they switch to an SCD diet while they're doing antibiotic therapy. I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things that we do uh, clinically when anyone begins an SCD is take a look at one at medications and supplements that the child is on currently. Um, because often there are illegal ingredients in medication and in many antibiotics, honestly. Um, you want to make sure if you're investing all this time, effort, and energy into moving to a new dietary approach that you control for variables that may decrease the efficacy of all that hard work. Um, so we typically tell families to check those ingredients and more often than not, we then make a request for compounding um, that prescription. So that, I guess, is one thing I would caution you to make sure that um, you make sure it's an SCD legal uh, antibiotic if it's something that you choose to continue. Um, the next thing I would say is there are no real, um, we have never had any issues with kids using an antibiotic concurrently while on SCD. 
uh, the things that you want to look out for or uh, making sure that you dose so that you don't get a stomach upset, making sure that um, you're giving those with carbohydrates that look different than the carbohydrates that perhaps you gave them with not on an SCD. Um, but also really thinking about um, overall implications of that antibiotic on the gut and the microbiome itself. And perhaps the SCD alone might assist in uh, treatment um, and resolution of some of the symptoms that you're using the antibiotics for in the first place. Okay. This next question is about dental issues. They're asking about dental issues using SCD. Are there any nutritional concerns that might impact teeth uh, going on such a restrictive diet? So, uh, no, I think is the short answer um, because it's not really, um, we're not talking about a restricted diet necessarily. And the things that you would hope for um, in bone and teeth building specifically or quality of teeth would be um, minerals that a diet, a healthy SCD diet will contain plenty of. Um, and in terms of oral health care and oral health overall, I think as long as you're paying attention to, um, I guess, the diet itself and, and the components of that diet and also taking good care to um, it's really a healthier in terms of overall intake. It's healthier in many respects than a typical processed gluten and casein free diet even. So I don't think that um, there's nothing out there that suggests that oral health or um, teeth care is impacted by a switch to SCD um, as long as you're paying attention to getting the appropriate nutrition in. Okay. So this parent's asking, it sounds like parents continued the diet after the study concluded. Is it forever or is there a, is the hope that eventually you'll transition back to a GFCF diet or a different diet? Again, I think that's a great question. And I think the answer is that it's different for every child and every um, individual who chooses dietary intervention. Some children um, and individuals respond really well and dramatically to uh, the intervention. They maintain it for a period of time. Food is uh, introduced that is SCD legal across um, a time frame. Preferably, we follow a staged approach to food introduction. Um, other, others don't. Um, but so the diet expands dramatically and you have lots of dietary choices fairly quickly and families believe that they need to maintain that. Other families follow the intervention, um, see significant improvement, but after a period of time, they back off of it. Often what families do because they want more variety or because they want alternatives is simply to look at moving toward um, you know, what have become popular diets now, a primal diet or a paleo diet um, or following a Whole30 approach so that you're still getting rid of a lot of the bad stuff that is avoided with SCD, um, but not keeping to a very strict intervention standard either. And each family in conjunction with the practitioner that they're working with really has to find what that sweet spot is for their child or for them. I mean, I have tracked clients who are adults now who've been on an SCD or primarily SCD with a few exceptions, uh, diet for over, you know, six or eight years now. Um, and they firmly believe that that's what makes them feel better. And I support that. And as long as we are paying attention to what's going in and making sure all nutritional needs are met, I think it's a fine approach for those individuals. Okay. This parent is asking about ketosis. I've heard that there's a danger of ketosis with restrictive diets, but I also know that diets, the ketogenic diet is a very popular diet. So when we're thinking about kids, how does that look from a nutritionist perspective? So I think um, the ketogenic diet has become very popular, uh, particularly in our community, as well as the um, nutrition community at large. And ketosis is honestly a very tricky thing with young children that does need, in my opinion, not 
necessarily medical management, but clinical management for sure. Um, with SCD, we tracked, I looked at ketones for a long time in kids, and if an SCD is introduced properly um, and followed um, consistently, um, then I, we never found ketones in any child's urine. We just, it didn't happen. Um, because the trick is keeping that, even though uh, it's, a speci it's specific carbs, you still can have those as a significant component of dietary intake. And that's where people sometimes get tripped up, that kids start eating protein and almond-baked goods, and technically it fits the criteria of an SCD, but it's not healthy. So you really need those carbs in there from a variety of other sources, primarily fruits and vegetables, too. Um, and that's what makes it a truly healthy approach rather than just limiting down to preferred foods that are also considered SCD legal. As long as you're targeting an amount of carbohydrate intake every day from healthy sources, there's no worry about ketosis really, but that's the key, is looking for healthy carbohydrates and getting them in every day consistently. Okay, this parent is asking about motivation. They are nine months in and they're burned out. <laughs> they feel like they're hitting the wall. Uh, they're looking for ideas for creative recipes, different resources that might be online to help with that. And then just, just they feel like they haven't seen as many results lately. So what's a motivating thing that people can look for to try to stick with it if, if they're hitting the wall? So I feel like if you've hit a plateau in response, um, and I know that uh, it's labor intensive to do this properly and the burnout can be um, high, um, I think that there are a couple of things to think about. Um, first, if you're working with a clinician, I would sit down and go over exactly what's going in. So keep a food diary and see if you can see where you've gotten into a pattern of the same foods that might either be uh, need to be augmented or rotated or removed to see what kind of response you have. Um, I would also encourage you to look at any supplements that um, might be going in and confirm that those are all SCD legal and also see if there's anything else that might be beneficial in this process um, of gut healing um, that you may not be using. Uh, I also think that look at in terms of health, just overall health status of the child and your family. Has anyone been sick in the past two or three months? Have you had some immunological hit such as a cold that lingered or, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the child that you're using the diet for, but look at the immunological environment and see if there's been some insult that needs just a little immune boost, either for the child or the you know, the other family members that would also kind of nudge things back on track. Um, in terms of resources for SCD, I use a lot of different, um, and I refer to a lot of different things. So one of my favorite um, cookbook authors um, that I find lots of unique things in, and most of her recipes are SCD legal, but um, others need to be tweaked. Uh, would be Danielle Walker, Against All Grain. She does really great stuff. Um, I also really like lots of different paleo uh, blogs that you can modify to be SCD legal. Um, and I look at recipes all the time from lots of different sources and work through those. We have lots of, um, I mean, we, I, I can, I'm happy to share if you want to send me your email and I can send you the list of resources that we share with families uh, when they come in for an SCD consult here. Um, and that will give you kind of specific links to where we would go. And I hope that, um, and if you have other specific questions about this wall and the plateau that you've hit, I, please email me and I'm happy to talk with you about it further. Okay, this person was asking, and you just touched on online resources. So I know there is a great deal of information about SCD online. So is there, you, you just named a couple of, really good ones. Is there a website or bo booklet that specifically addresses the kickoff or do you still recommend the Gottschall book or is there something updated that, that they might want to look at? 
So in terms of beginning SCD, I think that the Gottschall book really is the standard and the standard of care. Um, the website that uh, comes from that or pecanbrad.com, both of those are also great resources for understanding um, that uh, and following through on it. If you, the slide that I put up on the intro diet is exactly what we do when we begin an introduction. And, um, what, and to create that, all we did was look at um, the Gottschall book and then set out criteria for um, what, you know, what food intake should look like based on a child's age. And we'll tweak that depending on how much food we really want the child to consume over that time frame and what's needed. Um, and it just that's such a simple approach. And I always encourage families for the first several months of beginning this is to keep it as simple as possible. So um, don't try to get fancy with food prep because there's a lot of food prep involved here. And don't do that until you have the hard transition phase under your belt. So the simpler, the better for the first eight to 12 weeks and then expand from there. Um, and uh, there are other resources out there in general. Um, I, I would say start with Breaking the Vicious Cycle. Danielle Walker's books, one of her first, the first one that she put out, I think is primarily SCD legal. And there's really good information there on transitioning to a different dietary lifestyle as well. Um, and there are lots of paleo books out there that once you've kind of made the clinical shift to a different eating style can be helpful in adding to your um, approach to cooking and eating. Okay. And I know that generally speaking, it's, it's great to work with a nutritionist if you can. Um, but if they need to do it starting at home, that would be the jumping off point is to read those, get up to date on those different uh, strategies from those books? I think so. And I would strongly encourage anyone who uh, is beginning this without direct clinical care through that process to make sure that you have a good relationship with your primary care because there are scary things that can happen in the first few weeks. So fevers are common. Um, lethargy is common. It often looks like in that first week that um, our kids have the flu, they're just miserable and anxious, and then they one day wake up and they're out and it, they're good. It's all, but if you don't anticipate that and have moral support through that process, it can be scary. Um, I would also encourage you to make sure that you're collecting that data that I went through. Um, if you can get information on height, weight, um, current dietary intake, so that you then have something to work from as you begin to track and see what changes you're seeing with an SCD intervention so that you start with as much baseline information as possible going into this process so that you learn from what you're doing. All right, you touched a little bit on food allergies when you're trying to do a restricted diet and you talked about eggs. We've got a parent who actually asked a question also about almonds. So their child is allergic to almond which seems to be a pretty important ingredient in some recipes. So is there a good substitute for that that they might consider? Absolutely. Um, we have, and um, there are many recipes there, are, and specifically on pecanbread.com, you can look at uh, nut, tree nut substitutions. If, um, if the child is not allergic to other tree nuts, there are options out there for um, subbing that out that, um, there are adjustments in some recipes, but all that you can find on pecanbread.com. Um, I would also say that we don't typically introduce nuts or nut butter until the child is well into diet, so 12 weeks or more before you begin that. Um, and they don't have to be a huge component. Um, my Our clinical experience and also personal experience in, in um, with friends and family is that um, you can easily begin to rely on almond flour products or almond and nut butter products as a huge component of total diet. So a nut muffin for breakfast and crackers for snack. And then suddenly you're in that place where carbohydrate intake is skewed and you have all of this other stuff going in when you really need that coming with fiber and other things that are found in fruits and vegetables. Um, so uh, we use them and I, I, encourage families that we work with to use 
any nut flour product that's replacing um, a traditional gluten-free or gluten-filled um, bread or pasta or whatever you're trying to cover uh, with caution so that you're not overly relying on something that needs to be a treat, not a staple. Okay. So absolutely, I guess the short answer is absolutely, you can do SCD with no almonds whatsoever. Okay, got it, got it. So this question is totally a different direction. They're asking about biomarkers that might be potential helpful things to look at for dietary intervention. And they're asking about EEGs as a biomarker. Uh, would it, could it, objectively confirmed diet of dietary effects. Have you seen any any sort of studies that looked at that? I have not seen anything that looks at EEGs at all. Um, we have tried to identify um, other biomarkers that might be beneficial in this, but that really, and I know there are researchers out there who are looking at this from a much more bench science perspective than we are, but um, Right now, that's that all of that science is still emerging, and we don't see it a accurately applicable in the clinic. So, for me, if we're looking at a child who's symptomatic and we have a biomarker like lab results that indicate inflammation, for example, um, that for me is a, a, a a, a nudge in the right direction to begin an intervention to decrease. G, potential GI inflammation. But that's really all we have to, I have to go on in clinical practice right now. Okay, got it. The next question is about supplements. So this is a big one. <laughs> Trying to make sure that supplements being used are SCD compliant. So if you're out purchasing supplements, what is the best way to try to find a list of clean subs? Go to the pecan bread website, pecanbread.com, and look at their list of illegal and legal ingredients. They also have a list, it hasn't been updated in a period of time, but they also have a list of safe supplements that you can purchase from a variety of different categories. Okay, and then if they need any kind of uh, prescribed medications, is there a strategy they can use if it may not be something where they can get the list ahead of time? So the list that is on um, pecan bread is fairly comprehensive about additives in products. And so that would have the information that you need to make a determination on. So say your child has an ongoing ear infection and your pediatrician requires that you take amoxicillin. Well, amoxicillin, as it's prepared either in a tablet or in liquid form, contains lactose. Um, and several other illegal ingredients. Um, so we avoid that strictly because we typically do a non-dairy SCD. Um, and you would simply be able to access that information, ask the pediatrician for a compounding approach, and that typically is that typically works. Okay, you talked about bone broth a little bit. Uh, how was that given? Was it given like a soup to drink or were the parents allowed to cook it into things? How, how was that administered during that? Initial Both ways. Two days? Absolutely. Um, there were often, um, most of the time we, we just gave it to them, um, hoping that they would learn to sip it throughout the day. And that was the case most of the time, whether it was room temperature or warm kids, kids liked it and consumed it. Other times, families, when they were getting creative, so we had things like um, veg veggie noodles, so zucchini noodles, um, and they would cook the noodles in the broth and then serve that as kind of a soup. Um, and there were several other, um, there's also a, a, a really great recipe for egg drop soup that would be prepared with bone broth and then eggs. Um, so we used it in a number of different ways and tried to get at least 16 ounces in every day. Okay, this person's asking just for sort of clinical pearls. So this is another nutritionist. They're asking if, about your, maybe your top three recipes or items that you've suggested to families that seem to have the best success. So when you're giving them ideas about what to eat, kicking it off, is it, you know, what are the three things that you tend to see the best results with? Oh, gosh. Um, that's so tricky because... Uh, when we start a diet, uh, I think I said, I go for the simpler, the better. 
Um, so prepared really simply. And then we get into fun recipes later as we progressed through and added new foods. But um, I really like that egg drop soup. And surprisingly, many, many of the kids that we work with seems to seem to as well. Um, and the other thing that is always a big hit, though it's time consuming up front and early on, are meatballs and lots of different kinds of meatballs. Our kids tend to love that with SCD label sauces. Um, I'm a big proponent of making food for kids fun. So we typically um, try to work through um, if we're changing this from a preferred food like McDonald's chicken nuggets to an SCD legal form, giving lots of sauces and things to dip in as well so that um, kids can try it out. Um, Holly, what else do we do? Uh, veggie noodles too have um, initially I was wary wondering if our kids would actually have um, want to try like spaghetti squash or zucchini noodles and um, they like them after a period of time, um, being away from uh, pasta, for example, they like them. So that's another uh, thing that we often use. All right, I think we have time for one more question. This is a good one to end on. They're, <clears throat> they're asking, is it ever too late to start? And is it different to start with a young adult than it would be with a child? That's a great question. and. It's never, ever too late to start. Um, you know, we use this, SCD is used for so many different um, end goals, really. And it's never too late to begin to heal and help uh, GI status, in my opinion, at all. And um, we work with lots of young adults. I mean, the research that it's done out there on SCD um, in other diagnoses is, is primarily with adults, though uh, Dr. Susskind um, is doing some work with his pediatric population in Seattle. Uh, but all that work for other purposes um, and in other diagnoses is done in adults with dramatic improvements that help ov overall quality of life, that help with sleep. So um, it's never too late to start. 